When Alexander Kerensky departed for uncharted space in November 2784, he did so with a force of well over 2 million soldiers. Yet even this was just a fraction of the total number of individuals who had fought in the Stalig Civil War. If one includes the Periphery Uprising, a total of around 5,500 regiments had participated across both sides. While no individual successor state could come close to matching the mighty Starleague Defence Force, together they would far surpass it. The First Succession War would see more than 7,500 regiments do battle. The successor state militaries were at their peak, each commanding between 12 and 1,700 regiments apiece. Never again would they reach the heights that they did in 2787, more than two centuries of war have steadily reduced those numbers. The high water mark for warships had passed along with the Star League Navy. Only a thousand such vessels were left in the inner sphere, compared to the more than 3,000 Amaris and Kerensky had hurled at each other. From the moment the Star League Accords were ratified in 2571, the Great Houses were constrained on how much of their resources could be funneled into the military. Directive 30, passed in 2650, further reduced the size of the standing armies. Unfortunately, the good years were already coming to a close by that point, and with the commencement of several hidden wars and civil unrest, each member state of the Star League sought ways to circumvent the restrictions. When the Council Edict of 2650 was revoked a century later following the assassination of Simon Cameron, the size of the House militaries grew rapidly. In truth, most of that early expansion was nothing more than officially acknowledging the reality that each had vast numbers of demobilised troops that could be called upon to fight. Between 2750 and the beginning of the Periphery Uprising 15 years later, the member state militaries saw an increase in size of between 55 and 120 per cent. Throughout the Star League Civil War, every nation had made vast profits selling their military hardware to the desperate SLDF. Naturally, growth tapered off during this period, but the realms could see the growing importance of maintaining fleets of warships. The next 15 years saw them double the size of their navies by returning to service their many mothballed ships, as well as launching dozens of new vessels. With Amaris defeated, they pumped up production again for their own armies, but the looming threat of an irate Kerensky kept any from being as aggressive as they had during the years of Richard Cameron but almost 200 more warships entered service in the five years that followed. Even before the exodus, the Great Houses had made efforts to court surviving SLDF and Imperial forces in the hopes that they would switch sides. It was one of the leading reasons why Kerensky ultimately decided to lead his army into the deep periphery, to keep it out of the reach of the grasping successor lords. Around 78% of the defence force followed him, but that still left dozens of regiments lingering within the ruins of the Star League. Most of those left behind either entered service with their planetary militia or swore loyalty to Jerome Blake and Comstar, something which Blake did his best to cover up, but many others were swayed by one of the lucrative offers made by the successor states. Several turned mercenary and hired themselves out to the highest bidder. Some sat idle but ready waiting to see if their comrades would return from deep space. While the passing of the Star League Defence Force marked the end of such large formations as divisions, corps and armies, the successor states continued to use the same SLDF structure, where a lance was four battle mechs, a company three lances, a battalion three companies and a regiment three battalions. Regiments of shared lineage or loyalty belonged to less defined brigades, at the onset of the First Succession War, these units were at optimum readiness levels, fully equipped with all the supplies and material they could wish for. It would be the last time this was ever the case. House Curita's military was the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery. Like all of the warring parties, the DCMS in 2787 was at its apex, unmatched in size before or since. 146 battle mech regiments were available to Minori Kurita and his warlords, supported by almost 1400 conventional regiments of infantry, armour, artillery and aerospace fighters. At the top step of the DCMS were the five Sword of Light regiments, named for one of the five pillars of Kuritan society, those being ivory, steel, jade, gold and teak. They were the personal command of the coordinator and tasked only with the most crucial objectives. 
Unsurprisingly, they were the best equipped forces in the Combine, each regiment fielding four battalions of Crack McWarriors, plus two wings of aerospace support. Beneath them were the military district units, representing Benjamin, Dieron, Galadin, Pesht, and Rosalhaig. The Galadin regulars were the best equipped of these, chiefly because of Jinjiro Kirita, but also because the ancestral home of House Kirita at New Samarkand was within their borders. Smaller units included the Arkab Legion, founded and operated by the semi-autonomous Azami people, and the Proserpina Hazars, a well-trained and respected free-floating unit deployed across the realm as needed. The Sunzang Academy was the Combine's premier military school, supplying the mustard soldiery with a dozen regiments of its own graduates, green but fanatically loyal. DTMS organisational doctrine at the time grouped each mech regiment into brigades alongside varying amounts of conventional forces, with the exception of the Sword of Light and Sunzang Academy Kada. Barbara Liao intended to use the Capellan Confederation Armed Forces to press her claim to the First Lordship. The CCAF, as had been the case throughout their history, was the smallest of the five successor state militaries, operating 118 battle mech regiments and another 1,100 conventional units. Of particular note was the Confederation's doctrinal reliance on artillery, averaging around twice as many battalions compared to the other successor states. The Chancellor is the highest authority within the armed forces, advised by the Strategios. The CCAF is less homogenous in its structure, with several of the brigades broken into smaller subcommands or grouping dissimilar regiments. The Capel and Hazars were the best the state could field, but the individual units had a diverse range of backgrounds, many dating back to the old proto-states. Cyan's Red Lancers are the Chancellor's personal bodyguard, while Capella's Prefectorate Guard do the same for the ruling prefects. The Ares Titans are Capella's other elite unit, the Chesterton Guardians belong to their namesake commonality, Griff's Hazars, St. Ives, and Blanford's Grenadiers, Tikhonov. Two of the Confederation's linchpin worlds also warrant a permanent garrison in the form of the Marshals of Tikhonov and Andurian Heavy Guard. To review the standardised brigades next, the Andurian Hussars, Capellan Chargers, Cyan Dragoons and Tikhonov Lancers were maintained by their respective commonalities. The former Sana Supremacy had a rebellious history, their old ignominious Sana Sabres since replaced by the Liao Lancers. The Liao Guards were the personal brigade of the ruling family, while the Confederation Reserve Cavalry acted as the last line of defence. The Chesterton Regulars were as fractured as their home province, the Chesterton Cavalry and Cuirassiers are the only survivors of the old Chesterton Trading League army. The Ariana Fusiliers are another unit dating to before the Age of War, while the Ariana Grenadiers are a more recent addition. Shadrachs, Shadowhawks and Tristam's Avengers complete the regulars. The St. Ives Armoured Cavalry is even more decentralised. The St. Ives Lancers are the lead unit, while the Chevaux Leger operate further across the Confederation. The Capellan Quirassiers are one of the commonality's elite regiments, but are recruited from across the realm. The Centauri Guards are an amalgamation of several older noble house units, while the Teng Hazars represent another, but have remained a separate entity. The Redfield Renegades and Sharp Rifles have been raised by the respective homeworlds to bolster their defence. The Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces going into 2787 were the largest successor state military there has ever been. While the 120 battle mech regiments they fielded had them at a slight deficit compared to the DCMS, the number of armoured and infantry units in their ranks were vast, amounting to more than 1,550 additional regiments, totalling just under 1,700. Unlike the other realms where the successor lords had complete authority over the military, for the Lyrans, General of the Army's Paul Steiner, the Archon's younger brother, was in command. When the war commenced, he took personal control over the Kyritan Theatre and delegated the League border to General Amanda Lestrade. The four Royal Guard regiments were the best equipped and most loyal troops in the Commonwealth. Most of the LCAF belonged to one of five large brigades, the most massive of which was the Lyran Guards, maintaining 35 regiments split across five divisions. Despite their organisation, this grouping was purely for administrative reasons, as these units had no experience fighting at anything greater than regimental level. Other similarly large brigades included the Arcturan Guards, Donegal Guards and Sky Rangers. 
The former officially remains a federal unit, founded to celebrate the union of the three nations and being the first to draw on soldiers from across the realm. But over the years, it has become increasingly linked with the Tamar Pact. The size of the LCAF brigades makes it challenging to say which were best, with individual regiments varying massively in both experience and loyalty. The Lyran regulars were another large unit, notably less prestigious than their guards' counterpart, but often performing better on the field. Several smaller brigades were founded by wealthy planets and nobility, recruiting heavily from those systems. These include the Donegal, Odessa, Sacklin and York regulars, the Hesperus Guards and the Tamar Hussars. While the Free Worlds League military was not the powerhouse that it had been at the formation of the Star League, it was still sufficiently strong to see off their neighbours. In total, they had 117 battle mech regiments, plus another 1400 assorted conventional ones. An ever-present hurdle for the Marinx when bringing their might to bear was to secure the support of the provincial forces. As shown during the Third Hidden War, if any duchy or principality withheld their troops, it could spell disaster for the Captain General. Of the federal forces, the Free World's Guards and Atrian Dragoons were the best supplied and most fanatical in their loyalty. The former had all been reinforced with a 4th Battalion. The largest brigade within the FWLM, and indeed the entire Inner Sphere, was the Marek Militia, numbering 40 regiments until the loss of the 34th during the Phony War. They varied significantly in experience, and were most often tasked with providing protection to the many independent worlds, or ensuring the supremacy of the Captain General over the smaller provinces by maintaining a garrison within their borders. Occupying a middle ground between the federal and provincial forces were the Boland defenders. At the top of the provincial forces were the Fusiliers of Orient and their vassal states Orloff Grenadiers. The incredible wealth available to the Grand Duchy meant these two were better equipped than even the best federal units. The former were organised into four combined arms brigades along old Star League lines, plus a fifth Ducal Guard regiment. House Allison heaped all its love and attention on the Fusiliers, leaving the Orient Hazars to pick up the scraps. Their counterparts in the other two major provinces were the Marek Guard and Regulan Hazars. The Stuart Dragoons continued to operate as a de facto federal brigade, Earl David Stuart ceding control to the Captain General during the Third Hidden War. The primary offensive force of this small province was the Juggernaut Regiment, the defence left to the Home Guard. Other planets within the commonality raised their own units, the Helm Quirrasiers and Tania Dragoons. The defenders of Andurium were responsible for protecting what was left of the fractured Andurian duchy from Capellan aggression. Lastly, the Iron Guards were formed from the former Hegemony Worlds that had willingly sided with the Free Worlds League. The Armed Forces of the Federated Sons was one of the smaller militaries overall, but had a higher percentage of battle mechs, 132 mech regiments to more than 1,250 conventional. The AWFS had a well-organised structure on the surface, but suffered from factionalism and a provincial attitude that would cost them dearly during the war. Each march fielded an offensive brigade and a defensive march militia. A dozen smaller brigades assisted them where needed, at least in theory. Perhaps the most elite and loyal unit in existence, the Davian Brigade of Guards was the very best the ruling house could call upon. They trained extensively in combined arms operations, allowing them to make full use of their permanently assigned infantry, armour and aerospace assets. One step down, but still more than a match for most opponents on the field, were the Avalon Hazars. While they hailed from the Crucis March, it seemed extraordinarily unlikely that any aggressor would ever penetrate that far and so in practice were scattered all across the realm. The entire brigade had been reinforced during the build-up, each regiment fielding four battalions apiece. The Robinson Chevaliers and Certis Fusiliers were each named for their respective march capitals, with at least 20 regiments each positioned along their border. Additionally, each march capital also raised a force purely from that one planet's population, known as the Robinson Rangers, Certis Hazars and New Avalon Borderers. Two other worlds that did the same formed the Argyle Lancers and Clovis Guards. The Arcadian Quirrasiers were raised from the Chesterton worlds that fell on the Davian side of the border. The Seti Hazars were a combined arms brigade modelled on Star League Light Horse regiments. 
the Dragon Lords came into existence during the Reunification War as a quick response force to combat any Taurian incursions. The tank-ready loyalists were built around the units who had abandoned Lord Adavian during the nation's civil war and sided with the future First Prince. Many of the former Star League Defence Force personnel that had decided to remain in the Inner Sphere signed on with one of the successor states, but the AWFS alone organised most of its SLDF recruits into their own units, the first among which would use their expertise to train new regiments in Star League doctrine. The Crucis Lancers was an old disbanded brigade brought back into service after the Exodus and has since become one of their most celebrated. Two regiments were still in training at the war's outset, but would enter service within the year. The Deneb Light Cavalry were the remains of a joint Star League Fed Sons venture known as the Rapid Deployment Mixed Arm Forces. Their regiments were primarily raised from the Davian member state, and those who didn't depart on the Exodus soon went over. The final element of the armed forces were the Capellan, Crucis, and Draconis March Militias. Devised by John Davian as a way to turn the best of his planetary garrisons into a more mobile force, these large combined arms units added considerable strength to the AWFS on paper, but it meant that each combat region had most of its strength focused in just a handful of systems. Most planets no longer fielded their own militias, leaving them vulnerable to a sudden incursion. In terms of sheer numbers, the five successor states were relatively even. Each had a realistic shot at coming out on top. Quantity is just one half of the equation, however. Looking at the quality of those troops allows us to note some important facts. The AWFS, DCMS and LCAF had the highest percentage of veterans and elites, whereas their counterparts in the CCAF and FWLM were slightly lacking. Less than a quarter of the Fed Sons and Lyran forces were green recruits, whereas around a third of the other realm's militaries were down on experience. On the surface then, House Davian and Steiner were looking strong, but there is another side to the coin. As previously noted, the Federated Sons forces were individually loyal to the First Prince, but struggled to cooperate with their immediate neighbours. The Lyrans had the fewest number of fanatics within their military. This in itself was not a problem, but both they and the Capellans had significant numbers of troops with questionable loyalties, around a third of their respective armed forces, compared to a quarter of the Draconis Combine and Free Worlds League, and just 15% of the AWFS. This had the potential to be disastrous if their soldiers started questioning the competency of their leaders, or if one of the regional blocs decided to break away. Fleet actions would play an integral part in the First Succession War. The monstrously powerful naval-grade weapons could obliterate entire regiments in mere minutes, but any orbital strike would rely first on securing the system, or at least the local space in orbit above a world. The enormous Star League Navy had passed into legend. Of the more than 2,000 warships that cleared a path through the hegemony, just 12 had remained behind. These were hidden by Comstar within the Terran system, their presence kept secret from the successor states. Many Age of War era Terran hegemony designs were in widespread use with the successor state navies. These include the Vincent class Corvette, Essex and Lola class destroyers, and Aegis class cruiser, as well as a few less common designs. A few Star League era designs were also dotted about, including later refits of those classes just mentioned, and a few dozen Cadet class transports, but also a rare few heavy cruisers. The Draconis Combine Admiralty began the conflict with eight fleets, two from each of the established military districts. This accounted for a total of 197 warships, plus a pair of corvettes permanently attached to the first Proserpina Hazars. The DCA crews were particularly skilled compared to their contemporaries, having conducted regular training exercises for the Star League Navy. As well as the older Terran-derived designs, the Combine fielded two of its own, the Narukami-class destroyer is on par with the best the Star League had to offer. A swift ship with a heavy weapons complement for its size, Narukamis can be found in every fleet. The Samarkand-class light carrier was primarily a support vessel, transporting three dozen aerospace fighters each. They were a powerful force multiplier, but performed poorly without support due to a lack of firepower and armour. 
The Capellan Confederation Navy, like their ground-based counterpart, was the smallest of the five successor states at just 157 warships. A significant percentage of those were also older designs, whether Terran or homegrown. Each of the five major commonalities maintains a fleet of their own, while a reserve fleet packs the heaviest punch, moving to whichever front is most in need of the additional firepower. Two designs of note have come out of the Capellan Confederation. The newest is the enormous Soil-class heavy cruiser, weighing in at 1.5 million tons. This vessel is built around a single party piece, the capital-grade mass driver. It is a challenging weapon to use, as it requires the entire ship to be aimed directly at their target, but if it lands a hit, the mass driver has the potential to obliterate another warship in a single blast. Before the conflict erupted, the Free Worlds League had purchased several soils from their rivals at exorbitant prices. The older design is the Dushi Wang-class battlecruiser. This vessel actually originates within the long-defunct Duchy of Liao, and was the very first constructed by the new confederation. Its all-energy weapon loadout allows it to operate for extended periods without resupply. The largest fleets remaining within the Inner Sphere belong to the Lyran Commonwealth, which possessed 217 warships. Each of the three states within the Commonwealth fields a pair of fleets and another squadron in orbit above their capital. The Lyrans employ a trio of distinctive designs throughout their navy. The newest and most numerous is the Mako-class corvette. One of the best ships in its class, matching any produced by the Star League, the Mako has both the speed of a corvette and the weapons and armour to match even a small destroyer. The Commonwealth-class light cruiser is an older design put back into production with new upgraded components. It has become a staple of the realm's naval defence. The largest ship employed by Haus Steiner is the Tharkad class. Despite being four and a half times the size, it can match the speed of the Mako, but carries a far larger weapons load. The Free Worlds League as a whole maintains a federal navy, but so too do three of the provinces, Andurian, Orient and Regulus. Altogether, they can field 159 warships. The FWLN is split into five fleets, the first through fifth based at Judone, Orient, Kanata, Tamarind and Gibraltar. The skills of the crews across the various federal and provincial forces are fairly standard, but the Andurian squadron is notably reluctant to cooperate with the Captain General, much like their compatriots within the defenders of Andurian. Two vessels define the Free World's navy. The first is the League class destroyer. The design originated way back in the 24th century, but all of these older vessels have since been decommissioned or destroyed, the last during the Third Hidden War. An updated League class entered service much more recently, with several key improvements. Twice its size, weighing in at 1.1 million tons, is the Atreus-class battleship. When the class entered service shortly before the Reunification War, it outperformed anything fielded by the Terran hegemony or nascent Star League. Centuries of development have made it lose some of its luster, but it's still an effective and deadly opponent. Last of all is the Federated Sun's Navy, which operated 184 warships in 2787. These are divided into four fleets, the Corwood Fleet facing the Capellan Confederation, the Spinwood Fleet towards the Draconis Combine, the Rimwood Fleet dealing with the Torian Concordat and rest of the periphery border, and the Crucis Fleet acting as a mobile reserve. House Davian has four ship classes unique to its navy. The Robinson-class transport and New class carrier were two vessels born in the turbulent times following the Davian Civil War. First Prince Alexander hoped these new classes would help bind the remnants of the old Federated Peacekeeping Forces from the fractured marches together, and give them regional pride within the then new AFFS. The Davian-class destroyer went through two iterations. While the first was somewhat of a disappointment considering the name it bore, the evolution showed considerably more promise. The largest vessel in their navy was the ancient but still capable Defender-class battlecruiser. Among its number was the flagship of the entire navy, the FSS Golden Lion. Besides the successor states, a few other minor powers also participated in the First Succession War. The hegemony armed forces, such as they were, consisted of those SLDF units who had not followed Kerensky on his exodus. 
In total, 17 divisions and a further 16 independent regiments had stayed behind. Theoretically, this amounted to 85 battle mech and 84 infantry regiments, but all of those had suffered heavy losses during the Stalag Civil War, and so their actual strength was a mere fraction of that. The vast majority were located within the Hegemony Corps, but further afield were other remnants of the Stalag still camped at their final duty stations. The most notable of these was the Eredani Light Horse on Trondheim, who would hold vigil on the world as they waited to see if Kerensky would return. The former territorial states were cautious about becoming dragged into the looming succession war and remained on the defensive for the rest of the 28th century. The Taurian Defence Force, while remaining officially neutral in the so-called Freedom War, had nonetheless suffered significant losses during the uprising. The TDF in 2787 fielded just 7 mech regiments and 63 conventional. 1st, 2nd and 4th Corps had been completely wiped out participating in the Freedom War, and only the Pleiades Hussars had survived from the 3rd. Three new regiments had been raised which went some way to replacing those losses, the Concordat Cuirassiers, Concordat Jaegers and the Red Chasseurs. The Taurian Guard Corps, consisting of the Concordat Commandos, Taurian Guards and Taurian Velites, had remained within the Hades Cluster and so had not been touched by the conflict. The Concordat Navy was the only periphery fleet to have surviving warships, TTS Panin and Vandenberg, both hidden deep inside Flanagan's Nebula. The Magistracy Armed Forces mirrored their counterparts on the TDF, 7 battle mech and 63 conventional regiments. Freedom War losses had cost the Magistracy Royal Guard the 2nd Canopian Quidditchers, the Chasseurs à Cheval had lost the 3rd Canopian Light Horse, and the Canopian Fusiliers were down their 4th Regiment. The People's Volunteers Brigade had been devastated, none had survived to see independence. Reventer's Iron Hand was the only new unit formed in the intervening years. The Alliance Military Corps was now a scant three battle mech regiments, plus another 25 of infantry, armour and artillery. Notably, AMZ Doctrine called for a greater reliance on aerospace fighters, mostly because mechs were symbolically tied to the atrocities committed by Amos Forlo during the Reunification War, and the Alliance maintained around 10 regiments worth. All of the Alliance Military Corps had been involved in the Freedom War to some degree, the survivors organised into completely new units. The Alphanats Guards protected the capital and ruling Avalar family, the Alliance Grenadiers were stationed on the key industrial world of Lushan, and the Balagorda Defenders were formed out of what remained of the old Fusiliers Brigade. The only other periphery nation to have anything more than planetary militia was the new Finnmark Free Republic. Based around a one-time provincial capital of the Rimworld's Republic, they were able to field a standing army of two mech regiments and a dozen more conventional ones. The other microstates had never acquired a military of their own, but the increase in piracy, particularly from the neighbouring Circinus Federation, meant that small mercenary groups could find regular employment with them. The Star League Civil War had shown that mercenaries would be an essential part of any future conflict. Whereas before the successor states had been content for local governments or nobility to hire small bands as needed, now they sought out the ever-increasing number of regiments forming from both the SLDF remnants and the soldiers of the Amaris Empire as they were released from POW camps. An exhaustive list of every one of them would take too long, but a few of the larger groups are worth mentioning. The Northwind Highlanders had first entered into a long-term contract with the Capellan Confederation in 2365 and had at least one of their six regiments serving alongside the Seacath for over 400 years. They were the largest merc units to have survived the fall of the Star League. The Stalingrad Division had remained in the Inner Sphere, accepting a contract with the Federated Sons. The surviving five regiments formed the Screaming Eagles. The Elysian Lancers had at one time been the largest of all mercenary groups, but the Civil War had seen five of their regiments disbanded. Now they served the Lyran Commonwealth. The Always Faithful were a brand new unit in service to the Confederation, with an unusual story. The three regiments were formed from veterans of the Star League Civil War, but notably consisted of soldiers from both sides of the conflict. The Blue Star Regulars were another of similar background. Two of the three regiments were led by recipients of Kerensky's Blue Star Medal, 
while the other one once fought for Amaris. Now they fought for Davian. The Lexington Combat Group were once three SLDF independent regiments stationed within either the Outworlds Alliance or Magistracy of Canopus, miraculously surviving both the Uprising and Terran Campaign. They also signed on with the Federated Sons. The Grave Walkers were an ancient mercenary unit consisting of two regiments. Their history goes further back than any other, their origins lost to time. They had found a home for themselves in the Magistracy of Canopus, though they were not yet employed by House Centrella. The Twelve Star Guard were another demi-brigade of former SLDF regiments in service to Liao. Of the five successor states, the Federated Sons was the largest employer, positioning its 13 regiments and pair of battalions along the Capellan border. The Confederation had most of their 13 regiments deployed to face them. The Draconis Combine and Lyran Commonwealth had seven regiments each, plus another battalion-sized unit, all of which they deployed to just one of their borders. The Free Wells League was sorely lacking, having hired only Gladstone's gladiators. A handful of other mercenaries were scattered around the periphery, though none had yet found employment with those nations. The First Succession War would see a new type of brutality unleashed on the Inner Sphere. Throughout the Age of War, conflicts were governed by the Ares Conventions. Though not without their problems, they did help to reduce civilian casualties. When they were rescinded at the onset of the Reunification War, it became acceptable to slaughter tens of thousands as long as the military objective was accomplished. The Star League Civil War had seen the Amaris Empire use entire cities as human shields, or deliberate destruction of whole populations to create humanitarian disasters that would slow Kerensky's advance. Very quickly, the military leaders of the successor states determined that in the First Succession War, the extermination of cities would become the objective itself. The death toll would soon reach apocalyptic levels. The stage was set, troops were in place, intentions declared. Now everyone waited to see who would make the first move. This is it then guys, the end of the beginning, which means next Saturday, the beginning of the end. Over the last three chapters, we have covered everything that has transpired since Kerensky's exodus and everything that was going on behind the scenes during the Star League Civil War, as far as the successor states were concerned. We have taken a snapshot of the Inner Sphere moments before disaster, and now we just have to see how it all pans out. It has all been building to one climactic moment. The First Succession War is just about to begin. In next week's chapter, Armageddon arrives in the Inner Sphere. If you are somehow unaware, the First Succession War is by far the most destructive event in the Battletech universe, and we're going to be going through it year by year, all the major battles, all the raiding on shipyards, vital industry, and major population centers of course. There are war crimes and WMDs aplenty, the first year already things are pretty disastrous, and it only gets worse. Like I said, we will be back next Saturday for the next chapter in this series. I hope to see you all there. If you have enjoyed these videos and you want to support the channel, you can really help by sharing them around with other people. It is the number one thing that YouTube looks at when it's trying to determine how much it's going to promote a video, how many people have come from off the platform to view something on YouTube uh, is a tremendous boost in the algorithm. Other things you can do, of course, leave me a like, leave me a comment. I'll try to respond to as many as I can, even if I don't, rest assured I have read them. You can subscribe if you don't want to miss the rest of this series. And if you want to go even further and support me financially, I do have a Patreon linked in the description. If you become a patron today, you won't have to wait until next week because the next two or three episodes are already available there. Thank you once again for watching. I am already getting hyped to see the reaction to the next episode, and especially the one that comes after that. I hope to see as many of you there as can make it. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you on another video.